Welcome, welcome. We got a new podcast for you. Uh, this one is going to be a doozy. So basically what it is, is it's called Pop Culture Petri Dish. And uh, I'm Abe Epperson, and I don't know much about science uh, other than a layman's understanding of it. But here I have with me Christian Ramirez. Say hello. Hello, everyone. I'm here and I've done, I know slightly more about science because I've been tasked with researching these topics. I did some uh, work in college as in biotech, doing lab work, mm. doing some stuff with gene editing and that kind of stuff. Yeah, so you've kind of been in the lab, but also you are a uh, pop culture enthusiast as we all are. And so this podcast is going to be examining science fiction and where it meets reality, and how reality sometimes takes a little nod from science fiction or vice versa, and we're going to talk about where those two meet. So uh, what's this topic today? Today we are going to talk about virtual reality. Mm. Yeah, this is something that a lot of people I'm sure know about because of the video game industry. It's really big right now. Um, so I'm just going to start off with the definition so we have some common ground. The current definition is an artificial environment which is experienced through sensory stimuli, such as sights and sounds, provided by a computer and in which one's actions partially determine what happens in the environment. Also, the technology used to create or access a virtual reality. Ah, so we're talking pop culture examples like, uh, you know, the holodeck. Mm -hmm. Uh, you wrote down Ready Player One, which is coming yes. out, which is a Spielberg movie yep. based on a book. And, uh, of course, you know, everything like computers yeah. is going to come from sex. So <laughs> we're going to have that to uh, look forward to. Yeah. If you remember the headsets they wear in Demolition Man when they want to... Um, <laughs> th what. I don't even understand if it's actually having sex, but the one where Sandra Bullock and Sylvester Stallone that he refers to as doing the hunka chunka, mm -hmm. uh, it's that scene with the weird sex headsets. You know, there's always a question in Demolition Man about like the three seashells. Yeah. And I always imagine that that's like what you put on somehow it like goes on, like maybe one on your two eyes or like one on your <laughs> both eyes and then one on your butt. And then that makes you... Like, really enjoy having a poop. <laughs> like, that, that's my interpretation. It's of... just an extreme sensory thing. <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, we're getting into it just because, uh, like, we got augmented reality. Yeah. We got, like, a lot of gaming is, mm. you know, kind of charging forth and paving the way for this new AG thing, right? Yeah. Um, currently, like, like you just said, uh, augmented reality is really big. Of course, we have things like Pokemon Go. And just the other apps that have sprung from that kind of technology. And obviously, this is something that people have thought would be the next wave in gaming for a long time. When we were kids, there was the Virtual Boy. Mm -hmm. Now there's things like the Oculus Rift, the PlayStation VR, um, things like that. And we're even now we're working on shooting things in 360, which is kind of a form of virtual reality. Yeah. Um, because you're immersed in the actual scene that you're uh, watching. So yeah, that's that's kind of the current um, where we're at in virtual reality right now. But what we're coming to see with a lot of technology that's become real in the last couple decades is that it's just a tool that we can use. It's it's just like using sticks to get ants out of ants out of ant hills. It's just something that we can use to apply for different things, and that's kind of where the future of uh, virtual reality is right now. Like. There's a lot of applications for like NASA where somebody who's an astronaut, a trained astronaut can use a virtual reality headset to control like a robotic arm that can do specific tasks on a space station that's hundreds of thousands of miles away. And it and that way uh, you don't have to program a robot to do it. You can just have an astronaut that already knows how to do it. Yeah. Completing tasks. And then you don't have to launch an astronaut into space and figure out all those complications. There's obviously there's things like military technology and we would be able to control combat robots and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think a vendor's game. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's, there's lots of things that seem kind of scary, I guess. Like, cause if you, 
we have drone technology now that you're watching through a camera. It's not virtual reality, but it does seem like there's going to be things like that. But on the flip side of that, you also have things like in medical technology, you can use things like uh, CT scans or the digital imaging that they already do. And you can use it within a virtual reality context to kind of um, to make determinations on what the best uh, prognosis and what the best um, treatments that they can use for these specific things. Yeah. Because if a doctor is going to do surgery on something, they need to know exactly if they're going to be removing a tumor that's near your spinal cord. They want to figure out what kind of what kind of a procedure is going to be the most effective and safest at doing that. And when you have a giant blown up projection of that in 3D to look at, then it makes it really it makes it a lot safer, makes it a lot more efficient. That's the kind of stuff that we're going to see soon in the future. Yeah, I'd hope that my surgeon knows, like, I don't know where my bones are. <laughs> <laughs> um, because right now we have the ability for most people to get an MRI or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that is a full on scan of of whatever part of the body that they're scanning and it can produce a three dimensional image. Um, so we're pretty close to that technology. I think I mean, there's all sorts of things that will weigh on that, whether or not we have socialized medicine um, right. would be a big factor as to the accessibility of that kind of technology. But we certainly have the potential to do it. Yeah. Probably five to ten years. Five to ten years. But I think Damn. widely to the public, by 20 years, we will be be able to, um, everybody will be able to have a doctor look at a 3D scan of them. This is also going to bring into question the issue of um, actual, like, the ability of software to learn and stuff like that. Because uh, the one thing that is so val valuable about a doctor with that much experience right now mm -hmm. is that they have run into the different situations and circumstances where there could be complications. And so if they continue to use robotics, how they are now, as far as just be it being a tool to kind of project themselves into um, whatever area that they're operating on, the more that it does that. And the more we develop the software that is capable of learning from those kinds of experiences, then yes, I think eventually we're going to get to the point where we could have medical robots working on us. Um, that's that's farther down the road. But um, I think for sure, because right now I had my um, uh, my gallbladder removed and they used a robot for that. They used a little robot arm because it's basically it's a couple incisions and then they stick in a little robot arm that has basically scissors to cut off the parts where it's attached. But of course it was operated by a Right. It doctor. was operated by a human. It was and so but it's it's a procedure that it's fairly common to do stuff like that. It'll start off with gallbladders and appendixes and eventually it will move on to being heart transplants and stuff like that. Mm. But um there and it's amazing technology, don't get me wrong, but there are going to be some limits to it. And right now, even as we speak, we are running into the limitations of what we are currently able to produce, um, mostly because um, <clears throat> specifically with video games and simulations and things like that, the holodeck is still a long ways off. We're not going to be able to just project ourselves into a completely photorealistic world anytime soon because we don't have the processing power right now. Uh, I wanted to segue into, uh, because you mentioned it earlier at the uh, top of this podcast, uh, the military and its applications of VR. And there's a, a video that I saw like two years ago, and I just recently saw like there's movement of it uh, in terms of the technology, which is that like these... I don't know if it's SWAT team or like there's these... Uh, this special like kind of night vision style goggles mm -hmm. that you put on that uh, reads photons, um, not just of what you are able to perceive with the eyes, but you can like see behind walls, like behind you right now is my door. And then there's my bathroom at like a 60 degree angle. I could see into my bathroom based off the photons essentially being 3d mapped by when they hit, the 
uh, sensor of the right. goggles Your so sensor. you could get a 3d map of like what's going on in other words you know okay there's a there's a person there yeah or what whatnot and i'm like okay so now now we're playing video games with like 4d chess now we're you don't even need to be uh, relying on your eyes other than if they can see the goggles or not like almost a nearly blind person or a far-sighted person could be one of the best snipers in the world if they just put on these goggles what do yeah. you think about that kind of implication that's interesting because one of the things that um was they had this gaming conference for virtual reality and augmented reality recently and it was by name it was a gaming conference but a lot of the people that were uh, a lot of the companies that were working on technology were actually working towards um, using virtual reality to compensate for disabilities, to diagnose things like ADHD or autism, mm. um, because it was it was called a neuro gaming conference. So neuro gaming would be virtual reality where you control your avatar, or your character with your mind. You wouldn't even have hand controllers. You'd be able to do certain tasks just by thinking hard enough. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, there's there's a big push for augmented reality goggles for people who are hard, who are nearsighted or however visually impaired, um, because that's the kind of technology that can improve their lives. And yes, it would absolutely have military application when it comes to when you play a video game, you have a heads up display. Yeah. Uh, it tells you how many rounds you have, how much, how your health bar is and things like that. That absolutely is something that we could see very soon in the future when it comes to augmented reality goggles. And the thing you're, that you were talking about, it's just um, basically if it's trying to map something like um, what's on the other side of that wall, it would just be measuring uh, basically the light that's bouncing off of whatever is in that room right. and the light versus the light that's being projected on it. And so it's, we are absolutely very close to having heads up displays for shul for soldiers and stuff like that, because this is a technology, like I said, that is going to be used to address um, <laughs> disabilities too. And if we can do things like that, I mean, it's the sky's kind of the limit for what we can do with augmented reality. And it's kind of scary, I guess. <laughs> well, my, my question, I guess, is that like, that's all well and good to equip soldiers with the right, like, or the impressive means of technology, but why not just replace all soldiers with robots? You know, like, we're already doing that with drones, and obviously there's a learning curve, so to speak, in the programming, so it's not like we aren't just going to throw Robocops into the mix. <laughs> but if you can be a lot more cavalier, and a lot more reckless yeah. if you're not actually there on the battlefield. And obviously the people that we're fighting don't necessarily have that technology. So there's a whole question of morality. No, of we've already seen it with VR room and like what, it, what left to the device is gamers create memes. They yeah, don't, you know, exactly. Like, they're like the, the Ugandan like knuckles meme. That's, is that what, warfare is leading to <laughs> is that what it's no no it's we got to take seriously the idea that like people are dying right exactly uh, but i i don't know i don't i don't know if those memesters and those you know trolls are would alter their the way in which they would act if they actually did know like in ender's game like yeah. if ender knew spoilers if Ender knew <laughs> that he was not just playing a war game, but he was actually doing the mission and right. causing the genocide of an entire alien species, he makes it very clear that he would operate differently. I right. wonder if you take the, you know, like what we'd call the dregs of the internet or the, you know, not worse parts, but like pretty shitty parts of humanity where they're just like, I just, I'm 12 and I want to make a joke. Yeah. Uh, if you're like, yeah, that's all fine and good, but, uh, you know, you just killed a family. Right. Would they create memes? <laughs> that's my question about drone pilots. Cause obviously there's psychological tests and they do drills and they make sure that every drone pilot is, you know, apt to the yeah. you know thing. But like, if it's if it can be anyone, ought to be anyone. 
is uh, the question. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't, obviously the technology in responsible hands is something that we want to assume is going to happen. But if it's available to all of us, wouldn't it be almost immediately? Right. Uh, yeah. So that that is something that, I mean, this is a personal opinion, but yes, I don't think that this sort of thing virtually projecting into a battlefield and it being very similar to a video game at this point, I, I don't think it's a good thing. I don't, I, I don't think it's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's a very bad thing. Uh, I also think that the technology or like the the robot shoulders that we stand upon to be giants like yeah. that, that is awesome. Yeah. Like, I think that we should pursue and continue fighting that battle and paying, you know, all the funding that is necessary to extend that in the same way that like, I totally sympathize in like, have you seen Battlestar Galactica? Yes. There's at one point, uh, what's his name? The guy who's the, the Cylon, who's like the priest uh, Cavill or something like that. He's like the, the older Cylon. Uh, he's, he's like, I want to smell supernova. I want like, why is it that we decided to be inside these bodies with these, you know, eyes that only see and you, you look to nature. It's not even like a, technological advancement like right yeah they talk about how like eyes are different eyes and we have very great eyes but like we don't have insect eyes right or we like why do we only have why are we bipedal you know like if you had a robot that had eight legs first off terrifying (laughs) but second (laughs) off like probably a lot better at scaling mountains right i don't I, i don't think we want spider bots running into the battlefield with machine guns attached to them. Yeah, unless you're uh, what Kevin Klein and Wild Wild yes. West. Uh, uh, that's that's a good point. But no, um, <laughs> I think that this, like it got really weird and doomy for a second, but I do think that this technology also has the capacity to be something that can be a unifying force as well. Sure. Because right now they're also working on using virtual reality in schools. Um, Basically, we all have cell phones now, Mm -hmm. and those are very accessible. Uh, And with a smartphone, you can attach the little cardboard face piece to it and use it as a VR headset. Mm. And so being able to go into a refugee camp and see, oh, this is the cost of war. This is the, this is what's going to happen when we, when we send in the spider robots, this is the, these are the people that get left behind. These are people that get pushed aside. Uh, That's it's a use that is going to be hard for people to look at, but I think it's absolutely necessary for people to be able to, I don't know, to empathize. And it's, I think this technology has the capacity to make us, feel more empathetic to people's other circumstances because as a kid who grows up in who grew up in the running springs and the mountains here in california i don't have an idea of what somebody's life is going on what their life is like in yemen or what their life is like in somalia or wherever but if you can put a vr headset on and take me to see what the average life is like. What just a day in the life of this kid that who has to try to go to school in poverty, then it's going to, we have a great capacity for empathy if we want to use it. And I think being able to see and hear the things that other people are going through is going to push us towards being more empathetic. Cause as we've kind of realized um, the smarter you get, the more empathetic you get, the more you can learn to care about people. Uh, whereas ignorance is the thing that really holds on to things like hate. But yeah. No, so that's, that's absolutely fascinating. Albeit the worst holodeck ever. <laughs> <laughs> like super depressing. Yeah. But like that that might be in this, you know, political climate, in this societal climate. Uh, the kind of thing that we need to understand, like, uh, yeah, you know, like we we have all these thoughts about what it is to be in China. And as American citizens, we have very little information to go off of of what it means to be in North Korea. Right. Or like you said, in the Middle East, you know, like I think that there's a, 
a little bit can go a long way. Yeah. And uh, augmented reality might be the thing that like kind of opens us up mm -hmm. to the very thought process of empathy. Um, because sometimes you just want to make a Ugandan meme uh, right. uh, with, kn with knuckles from Sonic. Uh, and that sometimes needs to be combated with real life scenarios and real life uh, yeah. problems. Yeah, I want a world history class where I get to visit ancient Rome, where I get to like fuck yeah, yeah. That's that's what I want. Yeah, dude, <laughs> I want to be on the fucking moon. Yeah, that's exactly. Where I want to be. Yeah, and I want kids in rural Alabama to be able to experience the same thing. I want every kid to be able to have that kind of. Oh experience. man, just show them brown v board of education yeah I, that's that's another thing like there's there's talk about uh lawyers using vr to take a jury inside of a crime scene like you just have to scan the crime scene with some kind oh, of man. right with cameras and then you can take them to i mean i don't think you're going to want to make a recreation of what we think happened during the murder that, but yeah that has ethical right exactly issues. But I think if you can take a jury inside of what the crime scene looks like afterwards, then, I mean, it's it seems like there's a lot of ways that this technology can help that at least hopefully outweigh the virtual spider robots. Well, that's it's a very good pitch for why the strength of VR. I want to ask you before we like uh, wrap up here, um, what is your biggest fear about the technology that is being push forward in terms of augmented reality or virtual reality uh, and giving it to the populace. Uh, what, what is your greatest fear about that society? I think my fear is the same as a lot of uh, the authors of sci-fi uh, that they've had before that it's going to be something that is so tempting to us that we can get lost in it, that we can allow it to make us detach from the real world. It's so easy for us to binge watch TV shows and essentially become become a participant in this avatar of a story right. that when the story is completely, you can't tell the difference between reality and the story. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I'll be able to come back from that because mm -hmm. I love stories and yeah. I, I prefer it to my normal life. <laughs> so uh, I might just be Barclay. Yeah. or Barkley or whatever. That's, that's why you know the the architect was full of shit when he said they had a matrix that was perfect and people just tried to wake up from it. Yeah. I'm not going to try to wake up from that. I'm going to stay in the matrix. Yeah. Ergo. <laughs> that movie's a piece of shit. All right. Well, uh, I want to wrap things up just so that we can. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have a few episodes of this. If you enjoyed this, they're all gonna, you know, kind of time in around 30 minutes. And uh, thank you for joining us, Christian. Where can we find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me. I will be here for more of these episodes, but you can also find me on Twitter at Fanboy Christian. That's Christian with no H. Um, yeah, that's the best place to find me. All right. Well, that wraps up episode one. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs>